could I just make the suggestion that perhaps we start off the discussion with questions related to the microbiome and then open it up for more general discussion afterwards? I think anything we eat or we put into our mouth uh, will end up in the microbiome chain. You can learn that from metformin, which has quite massive impact on the microbiome. And if you put in a non-digestible carbohydrate, it, it will be in some way taken up by the microbiome chain. So that doesn't mean much. In that paper, actually, he came up with an increase in bacteria which generated uh, short-chain fatty acids, which are the good guys in general. So it was quite contradictory. And the other problem is whenever you say something bad about artificial sweeteners, it's easy to publish. If you say something good, you're bought. Well, your point is well taken, um, that certainly there are a lot of things we don't know about the microbiome, and certainly, you know, we know all different dietary exposures and non-dietary exposures change the microbiome. So I guess my, my response to that would be that, you know, even though there were certainly issues with, with the data, perhaps issues with the interpretation of the data, I don't think that's a reason to just dismiss it. And I really do believe that we do need to follow up on this, given what we're learning more and more about the microbiome in relation to health outcomes. And given that this has been seen in other studies, again, in rodents, but that this does need to be assessed in humans. So certainly, you know, I had to argue the side of yes, but I would, that was what I was assigned. Thank you, John. Um, but, you know, there's a lot we don't know. And so I wouldn't feel comfortable saying that, you know, they change it in a bad way, but that we need to look into this further. And Andreas, I agree. I think you're absolutely right. And I think we have to ask the question, does it matter? I don't think the microbiome, we can really classify it as an endpoint or certainly an outcome. I think it's a pathway through which some things might work, but at the moment it's just a pathway. I don't see it as a viable outcome until we can actually answer the question, does it matter? We've seen the information from humans and from animals. I want to go a little bit further back. Do we have any information on the effects of these intense sweeteners on microbiome in vitro? Yes, um, the various sweeteners have been shown to inhibit the growth of various microbes in vitro. So there's were studies comparing sucralose, acylvin, potassium, saccharin, and these are mostly in response to pathogens in the oral cavity. Um, and sucralose was shown to inhibit the growth of, um, you know, things that would cause dental cavities. And so. We, there is in vitro data showing that, yes, that does inhibit growth, but of course we have to think about the, the concentrations, um, you know, and is it because we're just basically giving so much that anything, if it was, you know, it could have been water and it would still be a problem. So, so there is in vitro data, but how, you know, relevant that is to the way we consume low calorie sweeteners is not clear. So you say there's insufficient I mean, I think in the dental literature, it's very clear. That's why dentists, you know, recommend low-calorie sweeteners. But if that's the case in the gut, you know, once something gets ingested, once it gets diluted in the circulation, and if it even makes its way to the gut, is a completely different question. Uh, Nicholas, a quick question. There were three people ahead of you, but go ahead quickly. My knowledge is poor in the field. This morning, I read an editorial for uh, last year, June. The recent, it is from Elinaf group in Israel. Uh, the recent realization that microbiome is involved in regulating brown adipose tissue. Um, uh, biology, and that intestinal flavonoid levels might be centrally involved in this regulatory pathway provides a rationale for modulating post-dieting energy expenditure through alterations of the composition and function of the intestinal microbiome. Question, do we have any uh, comparative uh, information with sweeteners concerning brown adipose tissue? Not that I'm aware yes, of. Because here there are a lot of uh, references on that. It's not just a hypothesis. I, I'm not aware of them. I haven't reviewed that. Um, you know, and I think part of it, I mean, I, I think this is, I get frustrated by this because this is a bit of putting the cart before the horse. I think before we start looking for mechanisms, we have to demonstrate the clinical phenomena is occurring, that is, we're having a change in glucose tolerance, that that's real, that there's an increase in diabetes risk. 
And then I think it's open to explain it, but I think we have to be careful advancing the mechanism before we've actually demonstrated the outcome. We've got two more questions specifically on the microbiome, and then we'll open it, David and Fred. Hi, um, I was wondering, uh, in the sweet trial, if you also consider measuring functionality of microbiota, because just, I mean, the composition obviously does not really tell us what they are actually doing in the gut. Huh. Is that also an idea? So what, yeah, if there is a change, what, what then happens? Yeah, yeah for metagenomic, for yeah. example, yeah. or yeah. Yeah. Yeah, metabolize. Yeah. That Thank you for that question. Actually, I would like to pass it on to Ellen Black. <laughs> <laughs> Who will be in charge of these analyses? Yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. We will uh, determine microbial composition, and if there will be funding available, of course, it would be of great interest to also look at functionality, because we know we have an enormous amount of controversial data in the whole uh, microbiota uh, field, because a lot of conclusions are related to microbiota composition, and we know that that does not automatically translate into function. Very nice. That would be excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Could David, put your hand up, please, so that she please. And while we're waiting for David, I was just going to say we're doing 16 sRNA sequencing, and if anyone wants to give us more money, we can look at uh, <laughs> the function in our trial as well. I just wanted. To that is what we will do the, uh, also. So, but perhaps looking more at uh, at metabolites, etc., at guts and system level. Yeah. I think I was, I'm way behind. I, the, the question's been asked. Function was the old the question. In the old days, we used to look at lactose fermenters and these sort of things, and we looked at function. It was a dirty business, because you have to get feces when they're fresh. You can do fish, and you can look quite nicely at the genome, but you can do it cleanly. It's really clean. You can use freeze-dried samples. It's wonderful. But when you get down there, you know, get down there low and dirty along with the feces, get them in quickly, uh, have, a, have a pager on you so that when the patient comes in, you're right there ready to just put your hand out. Um, but uh, this, th those, those days, I think, are important. But I'd like to just, uh, I, I think it's important to get back to those days, but you get dirty hands. But um, I think John's quite right. We've got to establish that we've actually got an effect before we start looking for mechanism. Could, could the gentleman at the back, Fred, right, right at the back row, who's got his hand up. With the Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> the white shirt, you said, stand up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wonder, you know, we've been looking to so many uh, effects of microbiota, of fibers, and even fructose uh, intake in rodents and mice, etc. Humans are not mice, humans are not rodents, and I just wonder whether we shouldn't be much stronger in counteracting what is going into the media, that these effects on the microbiota have adverse effects to humans who consume low-caloric or non-caloric sweeteners, because it's confusing the whole world. And I would say as long as there is no human data, all other is speculation. It's good for, for mechanistic research, but, but rodent data don't tell um, a lot about what's happening in humans. And I think we don't tell about that too strongly or too much. I, I would like to know what you would feel about that. I completely agree that the findings that have been recently reported in rodents have been sensationalized and have gotten a lot of media attention that may do a disservice, especially when these sweeteners could be, you know, very useful for people, especially when they're used, you know, to lose weight. Um, so I agree with you. I think that you know, like you said, it is mechanistic we're, and it leads to more questions. We're not rodents, completely agree. I do, and as I responded to the prior question, you know, I think we need to look at this in humans and the good news is that while it takes a long time and it's expensive, we do have studies underway. So John has a study underway. We've um, just completed data collection for a study at George Washington University. And so hopefully we will have human data out soon, um, regardless of, you know, whether that supports the rodent data or not. Um, but completely agree that this is something that as a field we need to work on. It's not just with the microbiome, it's with a lot of questions, and it's not just with low calorie sweeteners, though that is a common area where this comes up. And I think that we need to do something, you know, as a field to change this because it's very confusing to the public. Um, and it's something that, you know, can be a disservice if it's not managed properly. I would just like to add, thank you, Fred, for this uh, remark, because it's, it's like this, it's a myth about sweeteners, and it's almost impossible to get rid of it. 
It's been existing for more than 30 years. It started with a small short-term acute studies on appetite, showing a paradoxical effect of sweeteners on, on hunger and appetite. And it's been almost impossible to, to reverse that. In Denmark, even a professor in the university says, oh, everybody knows that sweeteners are fattening. Where do you know that from? You work with exercise. I mean, so it's, uh, yeah, good point. Could we just move away from the microbiome for a moment and give the other speakers a chance to answer any well, questions? Could I, could I actually come back on that point? Because I think what, in, in, in order to widen that, you've got a relationship potentially with biological mechanisms and a change in body weight over, over time. That will have to be expressed in eating behavior. There's no other way it's going to be expressed. And so we need to look at that link between biological mechanisms and their potential effect on the expression of appetite, both in food choices and total energy intake, experiences of cravings, and then we have a convincing story one way or the other. But without understanding the behavior, which is the expression of the biological system in the environment, we really are not going to have a clue. We'll take, can we just take the other question oh. first and then... Yeah, I just want to add to that. You know, if you look to the, to, to the study of Katana and Reuters, I mean, they followed up to one and a half year, giving, giving a very well-controlled study, a can of soft drink a day or a can of artificially sweetened. And it was very nicely double-blinded, that's it. The kids who got the low caloric sweetener lost weight, the others gained weight. So if there would be anything related to behavior or to eating more or to the gut microbiota that would be adverse in terms of health outcomes, I would say those data are already there. And, and I don't see this coming back in the discussions, whatever there is on microbiota, that normal human data already show the opposite, despite the fact that we need more controlled studies. So I would actually say to that that, you know, yes, that was a very well done study. There were 600 kids. They had 18 months of follow up and showed, you know, that if you keep drinking sugar sweetened beverages, you gain more weight than if you instead have a diet beverage. And so certainly that was an excellent, well done study. But there was not a water group, right? So we don't know what would have happened if they had a, if there was a control, right? If, if they hadn't had, you know, these were normally sugar sweetened beverage consumers that it was replaced with the diet beverage. So we don't know what would happen in the case of just addition. What if these were just added into the diet? And we see that a lot. Um, I don't know about, you know, worldwide, but in the US there's sweeteners added to English muffins, to yogurts, to, you know, sweetened almonds. So it might not be the case that we're doing a one-to-one -one replacement in, as that study showed. So certainly one-to-one -one replacement in lean, relatively healthy kids was supporting the benefits of low calorie sweeteners, but I still think that isn't a definitive answer. Okay, in fairness to the other speakers and others who want to change the topic of conversation, we've only got eight minutes left. Please pass the, have you got the mic? Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay, well, sorry to stop that discussion there, but um, I think this is a great session, and I think very successfully most of you have shown that it's okay to take, it's, it's not harmful to take uh, low-calorie sweeteners. Um, but I would like to play the devil's advocate and ask the question that in, in a bigger scheme of things, um, are we developing or helping to develop a culture that says it's okay not to change your behavior? So instead of trying to, to have a lower intake of sugar, here's an alternative. And what happens tomorrow when it's the same uh, when it comes to having more salt or having more fat? How do we deal with that in, in a bigger scheme of things? Okay, to come in on that, I think the consumption of low-calorie sweeteners in, in, in beverages is not going to be the solution to obesity. No one thing is. It is a complex system with very many drivers. So this is no magic bullet. And I think coming back to the previous question, that study was blinded. How consumers respond to low-calorie sweeteners it is interesting. If it's part of a structured weight management program, they may be of help. If it's taken as one method and then people then go out, we saw this with low-calorie foods, low-substitute foods, that people would consume these foods and then go over-consume because the belief is they'd save some calories. So how people deal with the information or the knowledge of them consuming low-calorie sweeteners is very important. We've just done a series of studies where we tell people they're having a sugar beverage, and we give them a low-calorie sweetened beverage, and vice versa. And they behave accordingly. They get a sugar buzz off a, a non nutritive sweetened drink. Similarly, they get no buzz off sugar, because the information we've given them. 
And that's the driver of the behavioural response. Dr. Helford, uh, ni nice talk. I'm really in intrigued about your impending Colorado study. And you, you mentioned Denver, correct? Yes. Yeah, so the unique aspect of Colorado is it has the largest cannabis users in, in the U.S. And if you believe the epidemiological data uh, that, that shows that uh, chronic cannabis users have a lower prevalence for diabetes and lower BMI. Um, I'm just curious because your, your primary outcome variable for, the, for that study, I think, was body mass. And then you had a secondary outcome variable for psychological aspects and knowing the effects of cannabinoids on both of those aspects. I, I'm just curious if you guys have considered what the potential ramifications of that might be, how you control for that. It was somewhat of a shock when I got to Denver. <laughs> I, 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 I must say that it was somewhat of an eye-opener. Uh, so, uh, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously the classic thing is uh, cannabis craving, the munches, so on and so forth. And, you know, if many of you will remember 15 or 10 or 15 years ago, we had uh, an endocannabinoid antagonist approach to obesity. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's affected, it wasn't sufficiently targeted to motivational systems which were specific to food, which was one of the problems with that approach. I think that cravings is a very important part of understanding why individuals overeat. Cravings are around specific food. It's different from hunger. And so it's very individualized. Now, cravings are important in temptations and cravings are important in lapses. But if you put somebody in a structured weight management program, you break the link between temptation and lapses because you give people coping strategies. And so they don't respond to craving for alcohol or craving for food, which is an inappropriate coping response, you give them an alternative coping response. So I don't think I've answered your question at all, but I hope that's acceptable. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Rabin, I just wanted to ask, you showed um, these nice studies where you looked, there were two meals and there were glucose responses, and I presume from the looks of those data, the meals were actually the meals that were in the diet, so the ones on the soft, on the artificially sweetened arms have less carbohydrate in them. I mean, that would be what the looks of those are. Yes, is that correct? Yes. They were not balanced. Okay, just, just to clarify what that meant. That was a nice short Thank question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, that's, that's completely correct. And this is, what, this is what it would probably look like in, in real life if you substituted your foods and drinks with, with sweetness. So... Your, your blood glucose and insulin would probably be lower than in other cases with the sugar situation. Yeah. To Professor Eben again, uh, in population studies which you mentioned, there was a reduction of BMI as well as of blood glucose on those, in those on sweeteners as compared to controls. How sure can we be that the decrease in weight, apparently due to decrease in food intake, is not etiologically due to sweeteners? It is logical, I think, to hypothesize that people taking sweeteners have decided a priori to reduce food intake, while this is not the case in controls. In other words, it might not be a specific effect of sweeteners, but something parallel going to those who have decided to decrease their food intake. In epidemiological studies, I'm not referring to animal studies where you control food. Yes, you're right. It could be, uh, it could be like you say. And also there are a lot of confounders. So if you choose maybe sweeteners, you also choose to have another lifestyle. And you might choose to to eat or drink differently than, than the, the other groups. Yeah. Difficult to control. Yeah, and there are all these statistical methods to control for these things, but you can't really get rid of, rid of it all, like, I think, Can in I the statistical me methods. Very quick one. To our psychiatrist, are in general people taking sweeteners happier 
as compared <laughs> to those not taken, provided uh, that uh, there are no differences in terms of sex, age, socioeconomic con uh, economic condition, and BMI. Can we make suggestions or hypotheses, or even could we study in future? Well, I, I, can't, I don't think there's a direct literature on that. What I, what I would say is dieting is very difficult, and it has lots of negative consequences, both in cognitive function and in mood. If you have something, a, a coping strategy, which is functional and helps you deal with cravings, then you might be happier because you're experiencing less of the negative consequences of dieting while experiencing the positive consequences of successful weight management. You have observations? That's more hypothetical, although again, you know, uh, these are things that we can look at. So these are ideas that we, and Thank we you. will be looking, we'll be adding elements of the consumer work that we're doing in Switch, which might answer some of those questions, and we will be bringing those into Suite. So we will have the data. Thank you very much. The co coffee time is down to 15 minutes now. <laughs> and, I, and I have a plane. Last question, and then the coffee time can be converted to a question time downstairs. Uh, Tosif Khan uh, from Canada. A uh, question for Alison. Uh, so we discussed low calorie sweeteners, but what is the data for other alternative sweeteners which are not high intensity for germ stevia and sugar alcohols? What is the data there? So I know there's uh, there's limited data. Um, but actually, stevia has been shown to have benefits in terms of, um, in, well, in terms of being, you know, anti-inflammatory, in terms of um, improving glucose insulin homeostasis, mostly in rodents. But then, in terms of the microbiome, I believe there is one study, and I need to look up the reference, but where it actually showed potential benefits of stevia consumption. Um, but not a very robust literature there. But I do know there's at least one study that I'd have to look up the reference, but that showed potentially beneficial effects. David Jenkins, do you have a question or a comment that's going to change our lives? <laughs> okay, I think we should probably, I think we're now down to 12 minutes. <laughs> so we should probably. Thank you for joining us.